<laughs> Hi, welcome to Not Sangly Stuff. My name's Bob. I'll be your host for this particular podcast. Now, I titled it um, Jen Schwerer because um, I, I kind of really like that film. It encapsulates a lot of, you know, the Polish condition. Um, I kind of, I can really identify it with it as a, as a Scottish person. So this particular piece will be broken into two parts. Uh, the first part will be me talking about my experiences with, um, with language uh, and some of the day-to-day -day things that happened to me in, in Poland that I, I find sort of humorous that I can politely tell, I guess, um, without getting into too much trouble. And the second part, I'll be interviewing my friend, uh, Charlie Pottinger. Um, he's recently moved to Poland and just to kind of see what his experiences have been as I moved here. Um, some years ago. Now, I would tell you the story about why I chose Poland, but um, we really don't have enough time. Let me say that that'll be for another uh, video. Okay, so um, when I came here, I was very keen to learn the language. Uh, I travelled around France and Spain and found it quite easy to pick up the language. Now, what I wasn't prepared for was quite how difficult and challenging Polish would be in regards to the sounds and uh, let's say the um, the way that you were expected to move your tongue to be able to say these sounds. Uh, anyway, I digress. So I employed in my first year, or I, I took Polish lessons, and um, very quickly I realised that perhaps um, Polish grammar was going to be a lot more challenging than I'd ever given it credit. In fact, it was almost going to be impossible. So we changed the tack and we started learning through set phrases. And one of my personal favorite lessons was when we um, we decided to go to the shop. And I'd been practicing set phrases such as, you know, Dzień dobry. I'm really impressed with my pronunciation on that one. Uh, and I would buy specific items. And then at the end, I would talk to the cashier. Now, how can I put this? We practice one particular particular phrase, um, and it would be that the cashier would say um, something like "chumash drobna," which I thought, okay, that's great. I know, I know, I'm prepared for that. That means, do you want the, the end of the, uh, you know, the amount at the end of the um, the transaction? Like, can I have the, the the change or something to make it up? Because back then I was paying by cash. I didn't have contactless. So I went to Tesco, um, and, uh, you know, there are other supermarkets in Poland, I should add, I shouldn't necessarily just, you know, <laughs> say Tesco, but it was Tesco anyway. Went there, um, bought some items, was so prepared, so ready for my kind of like, you know, I knew what was coming, Jamesh Drobna, because they always ask it. And um, the cashier said, Proszę Pana, macie kontrowetzka. I was like, what the hell is... Oh, uh, what? Oh, no. And I panicked, as usual in these circumstances, and just smiled and went, eh, I don't know what's going on. Um, so I went back to my um, class. I told the lecturer what had happened. And he said, oh, yes. Ah. So there are a few other ways in Polish to say, you know, do you have change or could you? So I'd got it down. Kontrowetzka. Drobne. Perfect thought this is it i'm gonna i'll go back to do my shopping next week empowered ready to take this on and um different cashier pay and uh the cashier said Prasha pana much as lotovechka i'm like what oh no i'm done i'm completely done uh this is impossible how am i gonna learn this um and that was just one of the you know, the, the challenges that you uh, you come across in learning any language, that it never goes exactly how you uh, anticipate. Um, so I'm pretty confident now that when somebody in a cashier says, oh, at a cashier says something, it's going to be, do you have the change to fulfill this transaction? Uh, yeah, so that's my... Um, my first experience. So don't give up there if you're learning a language. You'll find situations that you're going to find challenging, but you will get through it. Now, uh, secondly, I was really keen to be able to communicate where I came from. Um, so 
I knew I was Scottish. I wanted to say, you know, I am Scottish. And um, my lecturer helped me. And then I practiced on my colleagues. So I had, I had the phrase down. Um, I was pretty confident I'd got it. And I remember introducing myself to my colleagues and they said, uh, you know, where are you from? I said, oh, I'd like to practice my Polish. Could I try, you know, to tell you where I'm from in Polish? And they said, perfect, so let's try this. So they said, jesteś? And I said, jestem kotem. Jestem z kotem. And they're like, they started laughing. Oh, what the hell have I done? Now? How can I have messed this up? And they said, where is your cat? I'm like, what cat? I don't have a cat. They're like, you said you're with a cat. I'm like, no, I said I, I'm Scottish. And they're like, no, you said you're with a cat. I'm like, what do you mean I'm with a cat? I don't have a cat. There's no cat here. Why would I say I'm with a cat? I, oh, oh my God, this is going to be harder than I thought learning, um, learning Polish. Anyway, um, challenge accepted. I would like to say after the length of time I've been in Poland, I still get performance anxiety when it comes to saying I'm from Scotland. So I just say, Scott, 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 Scott. Give them the old uh, the old thumbs up. So that that is um, yeah. Another thing that's that's quite scary, and I, I you know I didn't really realize this is that we have a diminutive form for my name. So my name is Robert, um, but my you know short form name is Bob. Similar to let's say like Joanne and Asher, they they're two very different names, um, but they you know they're the same person's name. So let's say um. In um in French, Le Bob is one of those sun hats. Um, and I thought that's okay, it's a bit embarrassing, but still, you know, you get a little bit of a laugh, it can't be that bad. So I discovered that the cute diminutive form of Bob in Polish is is Bobek. And I thought that that can't be bad, that sounds really nice, you're Bobek. And then it was translated for me what what Bobek meant, and I'm like, wow. That is unfortunate. Perhaps I can mispronounce it like bub. And then that means a green bean in Polish, right? So, oh my. So, yes. So when I'm introducing myself, I'm either with a cat. So uh, I, I'm a green bean with a cat. Or, well, I think you perhaps know what um, uh, bobek means. Anyway. Um, now. As I started to advance in my Polish, or at least attempt to advance, I thought, you know, I'd like to, to meet certain people. Uh, so, you know, I, I was going to meet my, my then girlfriend's mother and father. And I thought, you know what, I want to practice a nice phrase. Now, we'd gone over a few weeks before the taboo words in Polish. Now, you'll know one specific, specific taboo word, which I'm not going to pronounce for you, but it has a strong R in it. A very strong R. Now, when we're practicing this with the lecture, you said you'll hear this word a lot. Often it is seen as a, a little, you know, perhaps a grammatical, you know, thing in Polish. The stronger the pronunciation of the R sound in Polish, the more angry you are. I thought, right, okay, so R. They said, Bob, you, you're perfectly pronouncing. So I, I had this in my mind. The stronger the R, the more angry you are. So this is really before the internet was widely available. I went home and I installed an online, you know, a, a, a CD dictionary, sorry. And I wanted to say, you have a lovely daughter. So I, uh, Tomasz Feiner, okay, I'm trying to find you. Okay, I've got that down. And then I looked up the word for daughter. I went online and it had the, the little speech thing that you could hear the sound. Surka. Surka. Ooh. Oh, that must be a mistake. Hard R, very angry. Surka. Hmm. What's the worst that can happen if I just don't pronounce the R? Well, seriously. So I introduce myself to my future mother-in-law and the first thing I said in Polish I dropped the R I said 
to mash finer. <laughs> Luckily, she didn't hear um, fully what I said and did a double take. Like, what? And uh, my then girlfriend, now wife, said, Bob said, Zurka, Zurka. Give it the strong. Uh. I mean, like I said, I thought, what's the worst that can happen? It can't be that offensive, because I know that the strong R means you're really angry. Well, that wasn't the case. It seems that um, I discovered a new word in Polish. Uh, I've decided that what I'd like to do to show something about my country and where I'm from is to introduce somebody who's a very dear friend um, and he'll give a better idea about what is Scotland because he's far more charismatic than me um, and that's uh, Lord Charles Gilroy Pottinger. <laughs> so first, before, before we get started, I've always wondered about this. How, how, how should I introduce you to... Um, other people. Charles. Charles, so we can just call you Charles. Excellent. Exactly, yeah. Informal. Informal. Mm -hmm. But if we were in a formal setting, what would be the preferred... Um... Just mister. Yeah. Just mister. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> Fantastic. Okay. So, uh, first question. Tell us a little something about yourself, like where you're from in Scotland, what it was like growing up there. I'm originally from Leith, which is um, um, uh, surrounded by Edinburgh. We're a separate town. We're ah, surrounded by water, so... Most people think if you say you're from Edinburgh, if you say you're from Leith, they think that you're from Edinburgh, but you're actually a Leifer. Um, I was brought up in Leith in the 70s. I was dragged up through the 70s <laughs> um, in one of the worst um, housing estates in Scotland. Uh, now, surely, <laughs> when you mean the worst house in the state, you mean the uh, most plush housing estate. Yes, you can't yes. Be, uh... It was called the Fort, and it was called the Fort for a reason. Uh, now, for our listeners, you might want to explain why that reason is. Because they built a wall around it so we couldn't get out. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you sure it wasn't to keep you in? That's what it was. It was to keep us in, yeah. Um, and we were quite... I was brought up really uh, very poor. Very mm -hmm. poor. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Mum and Dad struggled all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I turned 15 and a half, I decided to join the Royal Marines after oh. uh, military academy. Fantastic. So, uh, what was your thinking? Uh, you know, was it escaping, as you would say, the fort, yeah. or was it, you know, it was escaping. It was escaping basically poverty. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even though um, Dad was in the army, um, mm -hmm. they always struggled for money, mm -hmm. um, and I just didn't want that kind of lifestyle. As, as Scots people were often thought of as being, and I'm going to use the word frugal here with, with our money. Now, would you say that, um, you know, that's an accurate representation of us as Scots or is that something that you think? Yeah, well, when you when, when you talk, when you see a Scottish people automatically think that you smoke and you drink mm -hmm. um, excessively. And and, you, and you're saying that isn't what we're like. That isn't what we're like. Well, you and I don't smoke. And no. You and I, don't. I only drink once. And you know that's when Scotland play England. Exactly. Which has just been announced about next year. Scotland play England in September next year. Well, I'll be checking my liver in. For yeah, some I'm checking my liver as well before and after. <laughs> exactly. It might need some. Um... Um, but yeah, uh, uh, now um, living in Scotland now, I compare to the 70s because mm -hmm. be between the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, life got better in mm -hmm. Scotland. But since we've had a, a, a government that really is a mess, mm -hmm. and poverty is a big issue now. When I was young in the 70s, we never knew what a food bank was. We mm. didn't know what a food bank, never heard of it. Mm -hmm. And now it's such a common thing now that the people who work 24 hours a day are using food banks as well because they mm -hmm. can't afford to live. We weren't like that. So can you tell us, just for people that don't know, what is a food bank? A food bank is somewhere where you go when you have no money for food. Um, and big supermarkets and donations get gathered up into a certain building and you'll go there. Mm -hmm. to, you have to go to the council to get a little slip mm -hmm. so you can actually go and access food. Mm -hmm. And they give you like maybe a week's worth of shopping and you can continue using this. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a new thing, a new concept. Mm -hmm. It's probably been there before, but 
never ever used one or never hit, never knew anyone that did use them. And mm -hmm. um, back in my day, it was um, you got a provident loan from the provident <laughs> to get stuff. But now it's not like that. Now mm -hmm. it's um, food banks and it's um, you can go to charities for mm -hmm. money, things mm -hmm. like that. So I think it actually has got worse. Poverty has got worse in Scotland. And you know, so if I may come back to you mentioned fifteen and a half, you left mm -hmm. um, Edinburgh. And you joined the military. How, how different was that for you? You said your father was in the army. What yeah, was well, it? it was. It was uh, wow. Um, I, I went to an army barracks called GIB Euston, which is in New, Newcastle, just outside Newcastle. So mm -hmm. I was kind of in another country. I was in England. Mm -hmm. um, and every week we had to write a letter to our mum and dad to tell them how great the place was. Mm -hmm. uh, under due arrest, of course, you know. What, Newcastle, the actual <laughs> barracks? <laughs> actual barracks. The okay. army was great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it was different because. You got a you got a, a variety of different meals, mm. and you got wages. You got paid, you know. Mm -hmm. But what they would do is they would only give you half your wages, and mm -hmm. they put the other half in a in a bank account. So when you went home on leave, mm. you went home with lots of money. Oh man! You know it was great. You got off that train at Waverley, and you were just minted. It was great. Waverley's the train station in Edinburgh. Edinburgh yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you wore your white chinos and your moccasins. You know, you felt, <laughs> you felt cool. I would suggest if you want to find out what white chinos and moccasins are, you might Google it. <laughs> Um, I assure you, it's nothing bad. Uh, well, <laughs> I say that. I, oh, I'm a pink Lacoste T-shirt. Oh, oh, can't wow. forget about the pink T-shirt. Yeah, um, yeah, not something I could pull off. But thank you. Yeah, um, no problem. But it's always good to go back to Edinburgh. Though. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's our nation's capital. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, what do you think? Um, you know, Edinburgh now, from when you were young, has to offer. Uh, you know, to visitors, let's say to. Well, yeah. Now you've got the, well, you've had the fringe and the tattoo for quite some time now. Oh yeah, let's talk about the fringe. That's a yeah. very interesting thing. So I hear that's the largest arts festival in the world, and it's in Scotland. In that is correct. Yes, it starts on second uh, of August every year. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, memory serves me right. They usually have about two hundred and fifty performances at one time all over the wow. city at different venues. They actually open up some parts uh, in Edinburgh. They have them um, an mm. underground city, and mm. um, where the Black Plague was. And what they done is they closed off the underground city mm. and left the people down there to die. Oh man! And um, they actually have venues down there and tours of the underground city. So it opens up a part of Edinburgh even people from Edinburgh mm -hmm. don't see mm. during the fringe. They open. Um, and you can go into um, underneath the Cowgate, places like that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's really... And we've got lots of tourists from all... Uh, they say that Edinburgh doubles in size yeah. during the festival and the tattoo. But we also have the biggest street party in the world as well at New Year. Oh, wow. Hogmanay. Hogmanay. That so, goes for five days, that. So, so that's the Scottish term for New Year's. New Year, Year's yeah. Year. Well, it's Hogmanay. Hogmanay. New Year was formed in Scotland. Oh, I <laughs> I, I can well believe it. You're really selling us here on the fact that we don't drink and we don't smoke. No, we don't, but, no. It's just a party. Just a little party. Yeah, a small, alcohol free. A modest one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, you're now back from, from the army. You're going to... to... Ah, well, I'm oh. back in the army now. Oh, right, okay. I'm a legionnaire. Are you allowed to talk about this? Yes, no problem at all. So, um, I guess my question is, could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, story? certainly. Um, on March the 29th of this year, I was um, I received a, I was actually building my house in Crino, mm -hmm. and I received a phone call um, asking me if I could possibly come into Ukraine and help with foreign forces. All right, okay. Um, so I went into the Ukraine. Um, I am now the, um, the overall commander of foreign forces fighting in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Um, I've taken a, well basically a nine week leave mm -hmm. and one because I'm tired I've never mm. had the time off as you know yourself Bob yep. I've hardly seen you That's right. um, and two it's coming into the winter now and the battle is going to change from nice warm weather to the cold weather now mm -hmm. and with the cold weather there's going to be thermal warfare as well oh, wow. with the new drones mm -hmm. so I've got at the moment I've got 600 and 19 guys and they're all now receiving thermal warfare training mm -hmm. i'm fully trained so i've decided i put in a request and i'm i'm away i'm back home now for nine weeks so <clears throat> you were in the british army as a royal, correct, royal yes, marine yeah. yes uh from 15 and a half till um till i was 44 my word that's uh, it's 43 sorry 43 <laughs> it's okay i'm not going to check that out <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going to <laughs> 
So, sorry, excuse me. So, um, how? Tell us about your life in the military, in the British military. Fantastic, loved it. Went all over the world, done things I thought I would never do. Walked the streets of Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. and been to Belize and Central America. Mm -hmm. I every basically I've been to near enough every um, um, part of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. um, Kenya was fantastic. You know, I've, I've been. I so I've got a friend um, who's a train driver in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and he said that he goes on holiday three or four times a year, and I've been to more places than he can actually count. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was quite lucky actually many many years ago, many mm -hmm. decades ago, mm -hmm. I was actually um, in New Zealand, and I managed to go and see my favourite football team, Hibernian. And I was only one of the 13 fans standing on the away end at so, uh, Wellington supporting Hibs. <laughs> now, um, it's often said that Scots like to torture themselves, so would you like to clarify your support of Hibernian here? Um, uh, I've been a very um, uh, frustrated Hibernian football fan since I was a young lad. Actually, a very funny story. My dad's a Rangers well, My dad was a Rangers fan. And, and where are they from in, in Scotland, Rangers? The Rangers are from Glasgow. Mm. And I don't want to get on the, the full divide, but you understand Celtic are a Catholic team, Rangers are a Protestant team. Oh, so it's about religion. Yeah, it's about religion. Okay, okay. And um, Hibs are a Catholic team. Mm. But they're from Edinburgh. And um, I was only a, a young nipper. I was about four year old. And me and my friend Mark Waddle were out playing in the street. Mm -hmm. And then my mother come to find us and couldn't find us. <coughs> Somebody said that she had seen me and Mark go away with some men. Oh, so Mark. all panic ensued. And what had happened is actually me and Mark had seen people, big gangs of men going with football scarves to the football ground. And we decided that we'd tag along. So we went to the football game and it was great. We got lifted over the turnstiles, got in for free, on people's shoulders, fantastic. And we're coming back down the road, down Leaf Walk, and this police car pulled up and went, you're used to What's your name? I said, Charlie Pottinger, Mark Waddle. Get in the car. I didn't realise that half the Edinburgh police were looking for us. They thought we had been kidnapped. And it kept happening. You know, me and Mark kept going to the football. You know, we were young lads. And my mother said to my dad, you know, I think you knew to start taking him to the football. I think, you know, I think they have a word for doing this Stockholm Syndrome when you're tortured <laughs> and you start to follow. Well, my dad, his first time he used to road with me, we stand, and I swear, Bob, me and my dad were standing on the terracing, mm -hmm. and there was a big gap around us. And mm -hmm. people were like, Adam, that's my dad. What are you doing here? You're a Rangers fan, you know, because mm -hmm. there's that certain divide, you know what I mean? And we had this big, huge space around us. And my, fa my father always used to say that was the worst experience of his life, <laughs> going to Easter Road on the, on the, away, on the away side, i.e. the upside. I think a lot of people actually <laughs> like the fact that a man from Edinburgh supports an Edinburgh team. That's quite a... yeah. Well, you, was your dad from Glasgow? No, you? my dad's from Edinburgh. Oh, right, okay. Aye, he's just through religion. Ah, you through know religion yourself, yeah. Spot, yeah, of course. Um, I was brought up that way, but I'm a Hibs fan, and I love Hibs, and so does your daughter. <laughs> so, yeah. I wonder how that happened. Yeah, I've got a Hibs. I've got a Hib, I've got a Kelso Hibs supporters club now. Yeah, yeah. You've indoctrinated <laughs> my daughter and uh, your partner. <laughs> yeah. I suppose that is more than more than two, so it becomes a club. Yeah, well, it is a club. It's a fan club now. Actually, yeah. we do have. If you ever look at foot, um, football games at East Road, you'll always see the odd occasional Polish flag. Mm -hmm. well, I tell you what, I'm going to submit the bill to you for the therapy she has to go through <laughs> to get, get over it. It's a in the game sport thing. Ah, well, you know, it could be worse. And I also support Corona Kelsa. Of course. I'm going this Saturday. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I was at Poznan, remember? That's right, yeah. Five hours to drive to a football game. I couldn't believe it. Ah, I suppose Scotland's not that big. What's the long... Have you ever been to Ross County? Yeah, I've been up there, up okay. Dingwall. Yeah, I've been up there, I I think the furthest... Of, well, um, I've been to Dnipro many years ago when Hibs oh, played Dnipro right, in yeah. the Ukraine. I went there. Um, but the furthest is um, it's actually a New fasc Zealand. It's a fascinating story, that, isn't it, about the Dineet Prohibs, you, you, you know... You, the, the children, yeah. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we played um, a Ukrainian team 23 years ago called Dineet Pro. Hmm. And um, when we were in, we, we, we had so much trouble getting to Dineet Pro, it was crazy. That you could get a train or a plane to Kiev, but from there to Dineet Pro, you were hitchhiking. Mm -hmm. Or you tried to hire a car. And um, we got to Dnipro and all the hotels, there was only two, were fully booked with all the entourage of the football mm. team. So we were sleeping in parks and that, and we realised the poverty. And it was just by chance where we were staying in the main in the main square, there was an orphanage there, and the mm. kids were coming up asking us for food, and mm -hmm. mainly for food, not for money, for food. For food yeah. So we decided to start going in there with food for the kids and that during the day. We were only there for four days, and mm. we just... Our heartstrings were so pulled with mm. the poverty. 
<coughs> that we started up a charity called the Nipro Hibs. Mm -hmm. And all the Hibs fans, every football game at Easter Road, the Hibs fans dip into their pockets and put money into the, the pot for the kids. Mm -hmm. And they would send the money over to the Ukraine for the children. Um, in March, when uh, the hostility started with Russia, mm -hmm. the Hibs fans gathered together, hired mm -hmm. two coaches, mm -hmm. and drove over there, picked up the kids from the orphanage in Dnipro and got them out of there. Mm -hmm. And they're now living in the various houses in Edinburgh, all Hibs supporters. Oh, wow. oh, they're all sp spread all over. But they come to the games every second Saturday, so... So, so, so they have to go to the torture of Hibs now? Yeah, but the good thing is that at the moment, the Hibs fans have got a petition in the Scottish government to see if we can get the kids kept here, oh, kept, at East, kept in Edinburgh. That's great. Yeah, That's and really they, basically it'd be like an adoption, you'd adopt yeah. the kids. Eh? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're hoping that that'll happen. Um, if you go into the Hiberni website, you'll actually see the Nipro kids. If you click on it, it gives you the oh, full history. Fantastic. Well, we'll leave a link in the description yeah, for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, for the, for the, to let people read and, more Are you going that? to leave a link for my GoFundMe? <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> And my one for my daughter and <coughs> yeah, therapy. For Hannah, yeah. Yeah, for struggling to be a Hibs fan. So, um, I think, you know, what a lot of people would like to know about is um, when people say Scotland, they think of a few things like like whiskey or, or haggis or, you know, the Loch Ness Monster, all which are visible here. Yes. Um, yep. We have them. Uh, just watching us today. So, um, but you also kindly came dressed in traditional Scottish um, attire, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could give us a, a little twirl for the camera to let people at home see um, the kilt and, yeah. and maybe talk about some of the things that are uh, on your um, mm -hmm. dress, so that we can, okay. you know, get a better understanding about what it what it is to dress like a Scots person. Okay, no problem. Okay, so you may stand up oh, now and let, let us see. Give us a twirl for the right, camera. There you go. Anyway, look at that. What an incredibly handsome young gentleman. So if you could like to kind of describe, take us through the jacket and... Uh, yeah, you know, what it... well this is a new jacket, I got this specially made, it's, you'll not be able to buy these. Mm. Um, Does it have a specific name, the jacket? This jacket here, uh, this is an Argyle jacket, mm -hmm. um, the reason it's an Argyle because you can see the buttons here, mm -hmm. there is no um, tail at the mm -hmm. back, if it has a tail it's actually a Bonnie Prince Charlie jacket, which ah, okay. I, I wouldn't wear but um, it's a Bonnie Prince Charlie mm -hmm. jacket. Um, the tartan... It's not a Pacific tartan. Mm. It's an ancient. It's a, an ancient tartan, um, Sinclair. I think. Okay. Right. I'm a Pottinger, but Pottinger comes from the clan Sinclair, so this one was made for mm -hmm. myself. Um, poppy for all the soldiers that have died in battle or are still in battle. Mm -hmm. um, your sporn. Now people think that this is for keeping your money in. The sporn, uh -huh. and it, it is nowadays, I guess. But years ago, um, hundreds of years ago, it was actually for keeping your porridge in. So I've you seen. could eat when you were a Highlander. And of course, the, the modern kilt that you see now is not what used to be worn mm -hmm. um, in Rob Roy McGregor's time or mm -hmm. William Wallace's time. It was actually, a, it was used as a blanket at night, mm -hmm. if you remember, it would keep them warm. This is more like a formal dress. If it was informal, mm -hmm. you'd have the Highland shirt with the lace. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you've got your brogues, which weigh four kilos altogether. With wow. your segs at the bottom, metal studs. Mm -hmm. um, you have your. Okay, well, I'll bring it out. Oh, you may indeed, yeah. Okay, we have this, which is every Scotsman's allowed to wear it apart from in England. Is that right? Yeah, yeah they'll take it off you in England. But this here's called a ski and do. And this here is a knife that's only got one use. Not used anymore, but it was actually used for killing Englishmen. And you would have your knife. I've uh, been through near enough every country or every customs in the world, and the only place that I've ever had this confiscated of me was in England was in when England. I landed at Stansted. Mm -hmm. But I got it back, but they mm -hmm. took it off me. So we have that as well. And that's part of the traditional dress shirt. That's that part of the traditional dress shirt. Mm -hmm. Every Scotsman used to have a knife in their sock. Mm -hmm. It does say something about us, I suppose. Yeah. Well, let's just say we're ready for anything. Yes, that's it. Yeah, we're ready for anything. And the kilt is actually 16 yards long. Oh, right, okay. Um, so what's, what's yards in, in yards, traditional metric? Um, um, yards is about a foot and a half, so that'd be about blah, 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 eight feet long. Eight feet long. So um, I think you might need to Google what that is in metres. <laughs> yeah. Um, as we're not uh, au fait with the... It's about two metres, isn't it? Two, just over 2.4 metres, something like that. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of colour. It's a lot of colour. It's heavy. Yeah. You took the very bold decision recently to um, relocate yourself to Poland. That is correct, yeah. Um, can we ask, you know, um, why that was? Yeah, uh, my fiance is Polish. She um, runs a number of very good, um, well-known pizza shops in the town. 
mm-hmm. um, and she has the farm um, with no animals now, apart from me. And <laughs> um, well, well, Kelsa, what can I say? You've got everything. Mm-hmm. You've got the football. Mm-hmm. You've got a great swimming pool. Yep. You've got lovely uh, walking all around. I've walked the whole of this, this town. It's fantastic. Got good friends. Mm-hmm. Um, nice bars. Great yep. restaurants. Man, what more do you want? You know, it, it's like its own little micro um, city. You know, it's got e- absolutely everything. Krakow's like a, 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 a... You know, when I tell people I'm in Poland, mm. oh, Krakow. No, I'm in Kelsa. Kelsa's better than Krakow. It really is. You know, Kelsa's got so much. There's old prisons. There's... You had a ghetto in Kelsa, you know, so much history. Uh, certainly, it would, probably not the best thing to start off with, a prisoner in the ghetto. Is the well, I don't that... know, because you go to the Rynick in Kelsa now, they have mm. all those information boards, that they're in mm. Polish, mm. but underneath they're accommodated English as mm. well, which is really good, because I'm learning more about the history of the, the town that I'm staying mm. in. Mm. How many people do you know that live here don't know any history of the town, you know? I've got friends, I have a business in Spain. I've got mm. friends who have lived in Spain for 30 years and all they can say is hola, and that oh. is it, you know. I'm trying to submerge myself in the city that I live. Mm-hmm. No, it's very admirable. And that's what I was going to ask you, like, you've, you've been in now, what, uh, two, two years? Two years. So, what, it, what, actually, what would be the first, say, cultural shock you experienced? What was the things that you found difficult or maybe, you say, interesting? The police. Ah, okay. Yeah. So the law enforcement... Yeah, yeah, kind of, you know, when they, when they stop you for speeding and you mm. thought you were not speeding, but I got the kilometres mixed up with the miles uh, per hour. Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, but they were cool enough, you know, they were good. But I find I can, it's like in Scotland, you know, if you go like to Edinburgh, people are quite snooty. Oh, hello, yes. And if you go to Glasgow, people are quite abrupt. And if you go mm. up north, people are a wee bit more welcoming. And Kelsa is like the latter, it's so welcoming. Everybody here is... It doesn't matter if you don't speak Polish. They try and help. Mm-hmm. You know, it's amazing. The, the, the difference, you know how they say, oh, that person's got the Slavic look. Mm-hmm. No, but not in Kelsa. Everyone smiles. They're happy. Mm-hmm. You know, and why not? It's such a great city. And look, mm-hmm. we've got great shop. People, you speak to people in Scotland, they think that Poland's a third world country. Truthfully, they don't know, that, they don't think we've got big shopping centres and, you know, beautiful swimming pools and things like that. They think that we all live with horse and carts, you know. <laughs> It's interesting because, you know, obviously in 2004, when, you know, Poland joined the EU, mm-hmm. lots of Poles migrated to, to Britain and, and Scotland in, in large numbers to take up employment yep. opportunities. I would have assumed in the intervening, let's say, 15 years or more, that people would have become more aware about what Poland was like because of the exposure to... But that's just it. With the mass um, amount of people that came from Poland to the UK... You know what people in Britain are like? They must. They thought, well, must be that bad in Poland. They must mm. be that poor in Poland that that's why they're coming here. So they get that perception of what the what the actual country is like, where it's nothing like that at all. Mm. And when you, we all like our, our war movies and things like that, and Poland is just steeped. It's like Scotland. It's steeped with so much history. Mm. You know, I found out that I've got a great great uncle who's buried in Poland, wow. being killed in the First World War, mm. and I'm like. But we weren't fighting in Poland, but up there, it was actually part of Germany. Of course so was, hence yeah. why he was killed. In, so, and you've got Malberg Castle, you've got Krakow, you've got Warsaw. All the main um, points of the Second World War happened in Poland. Mm-hmm. So you've got all this history, you know, and, I, I, and if I was a Pole, I would have, I would honestly, I would have branched into that and done like tours of Poland. Mm-hmm. And it might still come, you know, somebody might actually do that because mm-hmm. it's such a fascinating country. It's absolutely, uh, from Zakopana up to Dansk, it's so fascinating. There's mm. so much to, to see, visit. I'm never bored, ever. That's fantastic. It's really nice to hear that you've got some positive experiences. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, one thing I think for those of you who, who might be, what's the hardest Polish word for you to pronounce? Keep it clean, of course. Oh, I can actually say it now. It's okay. um, Stupowy Vani Vani Minagani. Is that exactly? Yeah. Thank you. Right. Exactly. That means Stuk Nook. Stuk Nook? Stuk Nook. I, I, I have no idea. It's a short, shortened phrase. I think right? it, yeah, yeah. Stukas nook. Stuk there you go. It means is it something about the table's got a crooked leg. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's a very it. useful phrase. Luckily, at this university, the tables are all on a level. Short, short, I can't remember. Oh, Keller tries to confuse me all the time. So your partner's teaching you Polish? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> you told me not to swear. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but I love I love the Polish food. I love um, pierogi, croquette. I love everything. Mm -hmm. I love it all. Oh, that's fantastic. It's really great to hear that you know you you're immersing yourself in the culture of Poland and kind of experience. Definitely, it. you've got to yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, that's uh, twenty five minutes. I think we've uh, kept Charlie for long enough, and we have a, another appointment to go to. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you for giving an exposure to, me, to Scotland. It's really great that you came in. And, and we're not speaking to any Scots for them, no? Um, well, um, maybe on the podcast version, we can give them an extra time. Yeah, kind of, I mean, you know, anybody's I'll do that then. We'll, give them we'll a talk at our normal speed. Um, <laughs> I'm not necessarily, I think we might lose a few people if that was the case. But no, thank you very much, Charlie. It's really you're great welcome, that you came man. in. And really Are you not going to put your bonnet on? Let us see your hat on. Come on. Um, I'll maybe do it for the next lesson. Oh, uh, the next yeah, step, but... Come on, give us a laugh. Come on, I've got two feet. Come on. All right. So, um, oh, you know, put the Glengarry on. There we go. Okay, traditional, one of the many traditional Scottish yeah. hats. I'll put that on for you. There you go. Um, it really shapes my head. I can give you history about that. Please do. It was first designed in 1632 when um, the Scots formed an army to go and fight for King Louis of France against the Turks. And when they came back in 1633, they were given a royal charter and they were, they were called the Royal Scots, the first to foot, and that's the Glengarry of the Royal Scots. Wow, I did um, not know that. Thank you. And their motto is Nemo, Nemo, Nemo me le pun la cassette. No one shall harm you with impunity. Wow. Uh, I didn't realise you spoke Latin. No, I don't. I just got rammed into yeah, military <laughs> school. <laughs> I can imagine. There you so, go. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent.